Good afternoon. Welcome to LNL Bean. This is our 24th annual Spring Fishing Expo. This is our program and we have copies up here and you'll find them elsewhere in the, both of our stores here. And uh, this will be your sort of road map for both today and tomorrow and we hope you'll spend the weekend with us. And uh, this is our uh, 3.30 presentation and it's called Late Winter and Pre-Spawn Patterns for River Smallmouth. And our presenter is new to L.L. Bean. It's uh, great fun when we put these programs together. We blend uh, people we've uh, seen before as presenters and every year we have some new folks and it's always fun to have new folks uh, as part of our speaking roster. He's a pioneer in the emerging sport of kayak fishing. He's the owner of Blue Ridge Kayak Fishing. He's um, published a number of DVDs on the subject of kayak fishing for river smallmouth and he's also published articles in numerous fishing publications. And in addition to representing Blue Ridge Kayak Fishing, he's uh, here this weekend representing the Wilderness Systems Kayak Fishing Team. Please welcome Jeff Little. All right, now I'm going to transition from more from the paddling into things and talk more about fishing uh, river smallmouth. Um, <clears throat> this was actually, this was about this time of year last year, we're up in a, a creek that flows into the Susquehanna River and my buddy there is catching a, uh, that's a, I think he was a 19 and a half inch smallmouth on a soft plastic rigged on a, um, I actually have a, a a bait company called Confidence Baits and we make jig heads and soft plastic specific for river smallmouth. And he was, uh, my buddy Tom was catching that fish there. Creek mouths are, are on the bigger river systems. The smallmouth that live in the rivers in the spring will go to those creek mouths and they'll run up in some of these, these tributaries. So this time of year, maybe a little bit later, you know, the, the pre-spawn movement is to the creek mouths or near where they're gonna um, they're gonna spawn if you if you fish in you know through the winter and I, I got the the winter DVD that you guys were watching before and somewhere in there and, and also on my my uh, tightline junkies journal uh, video channel there's there's one there's a video or a chapter of this DVD that talks about how to from moving from summer into fall into winter, dial in on the spots of the river where these where the river smallmouth uh, they winter over, um, and the common denominator is that there is something in there that is a <clears throat> it, it protects them against heavy flow, in particular during that ice out flood. Because when you have these ice out floods, it's probably one of the more stressful things that, that they're going to endure. Um, except for maybe the spawning. The spawning is pretty stressful on them. But if you think about <clears throat> when you're paddling your kayak, there's certain areas where it's shallow and the current is, is going pretty quick. Well, the fish have to swim in that and burn a lot of calories in that same kind of spot. They're not going to want to be there in the winter when their metabolism is slower. Uh, they're going to want to be in those deeper pools where there's not a lot of flow, that when you have that big slug, slug of ice and and well like yesterday trees and trailer homes coming down the river at you they need a place to step out of the way okay so typically they're deeper holes with with much less current this time of year they're going to move from those spots in the direction of where they will spawn and the bigger fish will move there first so it starts like this you're you know you have the fish that are still in the winter holes and, and I caught it you know the biggest one I caught yesterday coming up here was a 19-incher. That tells me that the big fish are still in the winter holes, but they'll get to a point where they get antsy and they'll move to the tops and the bottoms of the winter holes. Okay? And they'll stack up in those spots, waiting. Usually it's for that first really warm rain, and then they bolt. And winter river smallmouth fishermen who've been pounding these big fish out of these concentrated holes are usually kind of scratching their heads saying, they were here last weekend. Now they're not here, or they say they're not biting. No, they're biting, they're just biting somewhere else. And that somewhere else is, if you know where they spawn, you go to where they spawn. Usually in a river like the Susquehanna, 
it'll be a series of, uh, well, like a rock garden or a series of ledges or something that affords them um, spots where there's protection from current, but there's enough current moving through to, to keep it oxygenated. They, they put their beds on a hard bottom, like a hard gravelly bottom, that if there is a high water event, it's not going to wipe out all their eggs or their fry. But, uh, you know, conversely, if the river gets very low, it's a spot that's deep enough that it won't be dry. So, it takes some time to figure out where they spawn, but if you're around enough in the spring, you'll, you'll see them guarding a bed and you'll know, okay, this is a spot. From there, usually you move downstream to the first example of deep water uh, that, that, that you're going to find immediately downstream from there. And they'll hang out there until they jump up on the beds and they, and they do spawn. Okay, I'm going to talk about pattern development. And this is a straight bass that I caught. Um, it was about this time a week ago. Uh, this was caught on the, on, we were trolling uh, these jerk baits. That was a, a uh, an x jerk jerkbait. And it was actually a buddy of mine who's very good at trolling that was teaching me the, the concept, or, or his system of trolling for striped bass. And that one, I think, was in the mid-20s. He got several that were over 30 inches, and we got it all on film, which was great, because that turned into an episode for the Tight Line Junkies Journal, which you can um, subscribe uh, when you guys get home, get, you know, grab the card, like I said, and watch that and learn how, um, how and his name's Alan Batista, who's a fishing buddy of mine down near Baltimore, uh, trolls for these, these bigger rockfish, or stripe, stripers, if, as we say up here. Why I put this up here, I didn't come here to do a presentation on striped bass though, I came to do it on, on river smallmouth fishing and kayak fishing, but what is the same with any kind of fishing is the, the um, <clears throat> pattern development is, is how you're going to catch more and bigger fish. Now pattern development is something I, would, I taught in the, the kayak fishing classes that I, I did years ago, it's in the uh, the first DVD I did, the process by which you develop patterns, and it's the basis for all of the seasonal uh, tactics DVDs. A pattern is a set of conditions in which you, you catch a fish that once you figure it out, you can go out and replicate. The process is that you catch a fish, you go to the location where you caught the fish, and you make raw observations. How much current is there? What is the structure? Is, it, is, there, is there a drop off there? Or is there, there's the riprap just in one little spot? Um, you know, how deep is it? Is it warmer water? You look at your depth finder and you pull up onto a spot and you're like, whoa, it's, it's warmer water coming it off that flat. Um, you just make raw observations about the location. You know, current, depth, depth, substrate, whatever you see, whatever you can observe, um, you make those observations. And then you look at what your presentation was. You make observations about your presentation. In this case, it was very specific. Um, Alan was going back and forth over a what we were seeing is schools of shad that were we were in ten feet of water. Um, they were they were somewhere in the middle of the water column, and we were running through them. And he was hooking up, and I wasn't. It was very frustrating. I go right next to him, and we troll, and it's okay. Uh, <clears throat> he'd catch, and I wouldn't, and it, and it was frustrating. When we went to a different area, and it was 30 feet deep, and we were over schools of shad, we could see him on the depth finder, and he would hook up, and I wouldn't. And I, I said, all right, what's the difference in the presentation? He gave me the same jerk bait that he was using. Um, and eventually I figured out the difference in, and I made observations about his presentation, and I kind of picked his brain a little bit. Um, we're, going, we're trolling at the same depth, uh, we're using the same lure, we're going over the same schools of, sh of, of shad, and he was going about, he was going 2.8 miles per hour, and I was going through a lot faster, and, and it's and it's a. I think I and you can tell on your depth finder how fast you're going. And I looked and I was like, yeah, I'm going at like three, three point one, three point two. Um, he's like, you got to slow down. You got to go a little bit slower because that trolling speed is critical. And that's one of those observations about 
you know, that, that feeds into that pattern development process. Now, the next thing is, you know, in pattern development, you catch a second fish and you look for those commonalities. He caught lots of fish and I made observations about location. Well, one thing that didn't matter was how deep they were, because we were going, or how deep the water was, because he was catching them over 30 feet, he was catching them over 20 feet. Okay, throw out that observation. We were over shad every time. Well, that's pretty critical. We were going, and once I started going 2.8 miles per hour, and that particular jerk bait. So it's a set of common denominators in fish that you have caught, and then you go out and you duplicate that presentation and find a duplication of that location. So that's, that's pattern development. What I'm going to talk about from here on out is specific patterns for river smallmouth from now, which is the end of winter, through when the fish spawn. And it really, what I want to do is go over each of the, the rods I have rigged up. Actually, we'll start with jerk baits because I just pulled up a picture of a nice um, Giannata River, uh, it's a tributary of the Susquehanna up in, in Pennsylvania. That's a, I think a five pound, two ounce smallmouth they call it on a jerk bait. A suspending jerk bait, um, similar to what we were catching the straight bass with. And what we do, I don't know if you, some of you that watched the, uh, the DVD I had playing earlier, any of you see my kids catch some fish? Yeah. My six-year-old is better at fishing one of these than most adults I try to, to, to get to fish this properly in the winter. Because um, I tell him, I say, Sawyer, chuck it out there, rip it down, and, you know, I might get this caught on something. I knew it. <laughs> and let it sit. And that dead stick presentation, that's not coming. <laughs> and here it is. I want to get it stop, stuck in a fish's mouth, not on the carpet. <laughs> holster that. That dead stick presentation is pretty critical. You cast it out there, you, you reel it down, and you let it drift. And usually, if you're drifting in your kayak, say the current's rolling this way, and it's over there, and, and you've ripped it down a little bit, it's going to drift if it's in the same current, the same speed you are. And you don't move. You don't twitch it. It's, it's going to, a good jerk bait like this, and this is a lucky craft, Pointer 100 in Aurora Green Perch. It's a couple more five pound smallmouth on that lure than I have anything else. You you dead drift it through the current. And they will come up on it. And I've watched them with someone else fishing one where a fish comes up and he'll pace it and he'll go right along with it. And then they twitch it because they see it happen and then the fish says, no, I don't want that. It didn't look right. But if you let it dead drift, it's almost like you're in a staring contest with the fish. If you blink first, or you jerk it, you blink first, and you, you lost interest. So dead sticking uh, jerk baits. Now, if you do it from an anchored position, or from, or say you're waiting and you're and you're going to do it downstream, I usually do it with a bait caster, but I'll put it out there and I'll let it, I'll let it drift down, or I'll follow it with my my rod tip down, almost lowering it down in the current and I'll thumb the bait caster and then swing it all the way up and engage the reel and then follow it down. So it's the same presentation, it's just different ways. If you're, if you're drifting with it or if you're stationary because you're anchored or you're waiting, let it, let it drift unhindered. So dead stick and a jerk bait is, is one of my favorite ways to catch them. Uh, how are you hooked on to that? How did you, is it a loose knot or a, a swivel or whatever? There, the jerkbait comes with a swivel, and I have a Palomar knot here. Um, I'm glad you brought up line. There's, this one's kind of faded, but if you look at my reels, you'll see a lot of this bright yellow braided line. And this is 20 pound braid, and bright yellow. And the reason I use the bright yellow is so that I can see the hit before I feel it, okay? I always keep my, my eyes looking at that braid, and sometimes you'll see the, the line is moving, is moving, is moving with that, that jerk bait, and then it stops, and I'm still moving. And it's like, that doesn't look right. Boom! <laughs> There's a fish, you know. So I have that, and then leading up to the up to the bait, this is 10-pound fluorocarbon. So attaching the 
the 20 pound braided line, the bright yellow stuff, to the 10 pound fluorocarbon is an all bright knot where you can use a uni to uni knot. Now those are, those are hard jerk baits. I also use soft jerk baits like this right here. This is one I made myself. Uh, it, this is a uh, one that I, I inject these myself in my garage. It's a Confidence Baits product. It's where confidencebaits.net is where I sell my DVDs and my fishing lures. And this is a dragon head. This very this banana shaped weight here and on an extra wide gap hook and there's a little screw in the nose and dead sticking, I will also dead stick a soft soft plastic jerk bait. Um, <clears throat> People think of you know the sluggos or the flukes or, or any of these soft jerk baits as as warmer weather um, soft plastics where you will you will cast them out and you will quick twitch them back and it's just tw -tw 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 -tw. not too many will fish these like a jig and it's a very overlooked presentation to to cast this out and and let it sit on the bottom and keep your line taut and just wait for that fish to look at it long enough that it says, okay, I'm tired of, of just staring at it. I gotta tell if it's if it's real or not. And you'll feel that signature small mouth, dunk, and you know, okay, bam, there he is. So it's just a different way to to fish a, a type of bait that, here, grab it, you want it? <laughs> um, that, that is a traditional, you know, warm weather bait. You fish it in the cold, uh, cold weather, but it's weight, and you're fishing it on the bottom. That kind of simple <laughs> look in the bay area there. Or yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, if you come up here afterwards, I'll show you that. Here's that's actually a jig in there. You can look at the the dragon heads. That's a spinner bait. That is a um, assassinator clacker spinner bait, and I will always keep a. Spinner bait. People wouldn't think that you use a moving lure in in 34 degree water uh, to catch smallmouth. They think, oh, they're lethargic. Yep. They're they're you know they're slow. You got to fish it low and slow on the bottom. Not always so. Uh, something like a spinner bait is spinner baits are magic. They will smallmouth in the winter are almost like they're in a in a trance like state, like they're sleepwalking. And when they see a spinnerbait, if they're, they're awake enough or alert enough to, to know that it's there, they can feel the thumping of the blades coming together. Uh, they just react to it. They don't, they don't think about it. It's just an automatic. And I didn't used to fish these in cold weather, uh, but there was a day that I went out and I actually made my own. Um, I used do-it molds and I make a lot of my own fishing lures. And I made one and I put bucktail on there instead of a, a skirt and you know I had not been catching anything I said I'm gonna try my new thing I've been tinkering with and I threw it out there and I caught a fish and I'm like no way and it was in 36 I think it was 36 and a half degree water down the Rappahannock River in Virginia and I kept throwing it and I was catching fish I was like I never would have thought that in this cold water they would go after something moved now I'm not moving it fast I'm usually moving it in a way that it is, it's, it's on bottom and I'll throw it out there and I'll let it sit there on a taut line like a jig. And sometimes when it flutters down and they'll come down and they'll stare at it and then it's, and maybe you let it sit there a minute, I mean 60 seconds, not like a minute, but 60 seconds, a long time. As soon as you start, you pick it up off the bottom and you move it maybe a foot and you let it sit back down. As soon as it comes all off the bottom and you feel that blade go dum 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 and then you drop it again, when you when you start moving it again is usually when they jump on it. But really this time of year you wanna if you're moving it, you wanna move it slow, you wanna get it near the bottom, use your heavier, heavier spinner baits. This one's three quarter ounce spinner bait. Uh, in the current, if you're fishing any current, which usually this time of year you're not fishing much. Uh, you're going to need that extra weight to get it get it down the bottom and really just grind it out. Try to wear the paint off the, the head of your spinner bait and, and let it sit sometimes like it's a like it's a jig. This lure right here, my name is Jeff Little and that is a little tube. 
these tubes, and that one is two inches long. Here it is right here. And in the winter, they, they will go after how smaller things than they will in the summer. Um, something that small, think of a crayfish that, that, that's that big. And think of a, you know, a smallmouth that's 21, 22 inches waking up from its, you know, winter slumber for, to, to get something to eat. That's going to be enough for them. Sometimes when they, they bite, they go, um, they'll hit something halfway and they'll rip the back half of it, half of it off. If they're just nipping at stuff, you want to go smaller and smaller. And this, and I actually put a rattle inside my little tube. So that again is a, a confidence-based product, but any smaller, smaller presentations of, of tubes will do the job. Um, looks like I'm, I'm wrapping up here shortly, but I'm going to cover one last thing. One last presentation. This is a little bit bigger too, and this is the lure that I got um, the one one yesterday on, and it's a three-inch tube rigged on a dragon head. Again, I had to rattle on there. Rigging them on a, a a dragon head is a good way to to have fewer snags. If you fish rivers a lot, you'll understand that it's it's very frustrating to snag your um, you know to snag your jig and always break them off or have to to go go after it. And the dragon heads are great way to avoid having that many snags. The, um, the dragon head is the hook with this little weight on there. And the, the website where you can find that, and you can also find my, my DVDs, is confidencebaits.net. Okay? Um, I, I think that's all I got. If you can go ahead and play, I got one episode of, um, of the Tightline Junkies Journal. Play the next one. And that is last week's episode. A week ago, right now, this was yeah, happening. Please matter. check out the, uh, on the website. TightlineJunkiesJournal.pivotshare.com.